morning at Forge Road Bible. Thank you for joining us this morning at Forge Road Bible Chapel. I expect, as you uh, all are already aware, the storm last night brought down some trees in the vicinity of the chapel, cutting power lines and closing the roads. So uh, we have dusted off and reinstalled the Zoom mechanisms that we all learned during the pandemic, and we've restructured our meeting to take it online. As Isaiah wrote in chapter 25, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm and a shade from the heat. And so although there was a storm last night and although there will be much heat today, we are still able to come together in this virtual setting to consider the Lord God, to praise his name, to consider his wonderful works and his counsels of old. We're very happy to welcome this morning as our speaker, Ellis Prince. Ellis is the pastor at Gallery Church in Baltimore City. He is a graduate of Liberty University. He came to Baltimore in 2008 to do church planting. He and I met that year, and I have followed with great interest the development of Gallery since that time. Gallery now has three branches, and the Christians there are doing a great work in urban ministry. Now, often we associate the words urban ministry to mean ministry among the poor, and Gallery certainly does that, but much of its ministry reaches into the more affluent parts of the city where it is also advancing the gospel. So we are very happy to have our brother Ellis with us today. Now, I will also say that Ellis was for some time the chaplain of the Baltimore Orioles. And he is too modest to mention this, but I will point out that when Ellis was the chaplain, the Orioles were a playoff team. And that's the kind of quality we look to bring here to Forge Road Bible Chapel. So let's commit our time to the Lord, and then we will give the meeting over to our guest and my friend, Pastor Ellis Prince. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are able to gather together even in this virtual setting. We thank you, our Father, for the grace that you give to us each day, that we would together rejoice in your name, live with the purpose with which, with which you fill our lives, and live as uh, testimonies to one another and unto the world. Father, we pray for the, the meeting of today. We pray that our time together would be edifying, would be strengthening, would be encouraging to all believers who hear this. We pray for the Christians at Gallery, that they today also, as they are meeting in their churches, would be encouraged and strengthened in your word. We pray for our testimony throughout Baltimore City and throughout this greater area, that you would give us an open door for the preaching of the gospel, that you would build up the saints and that there would be many who would be called and who would be called unto ministry and would be revived unto ministry and that your work can go forward. We pray today, Lord, for a good understanding of your word. We pray for a, a binding together in love for one another, and that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in our presence. We pray for those who are sick and needy among us. We pray, Father, that you would be close to each one, encouraging, strengthening, and in all things, making your presence known to them. We commit this time to you today, giving thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And Ellis, I will give it to you. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, you can open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. While you're finding Romans chapter 8, 
want to read a couple of things, a couple of quotes to you um, before we kind of wade into this Romans 8 passage. Alan Creter in his book, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, said this powerful sentence, God's mission is unhurried and unstoppable. God's mission is unhurried and unstoppable. Paul himself said to the church in Rome, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us. And then Tertullian, who was a second century church leader in North Africa, said this, let wrongdoing grow weary from our patience. In poverty, patience supplies consolation. Upon wealth, it imposes moderation. The sick, it does not destroy, nor does it for the man of health prolong life. For the man of faith is a source of delight. It adorns a woman, perfects a man. It is loved in a child, praised in youth, esteemed in the aged, both men and women at every age of life. It is exceedingly attractive. And so today, um, Ford Road um, Chapel family, it is an honor for me to be together with you as Tom shared with you. I've known Tom for well over a decade uh, and he has been strategic using his skill set and his practice in Baltimore to help our church root itself here in the city uh, so that we can continue to be a light um, in darkness. But if you're taking notes, which today I would encourage you to based upon Romans 8, I've entitled this teaching based upon some of the things that I've heard Tom share with me about the desires of Forge Road coming out of the pandemic and re-engaging together and missionally getting involved with one another in your community, but also in Baltimore City and all probably around the world as well. I've entitled this particular teaching, Groaning and Hoping. And so we'll find that a little bit more as we step into this, but it's a, it is an honor. And I would have loved to have been able to be there in person with you, uh, but I am grateful for technology so that we can be together. So let me start reading in Romans chapter eight, and I'm going to start reading in Romans chapter in verse 18, if you would follow along with me. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And I love the way that that word perseverance is translated in another um, version of the Bible. It's that last sentence says, we must wait patiently and confidently. Groaning, I believe, is a word that we are all familiar with. And it is probably the description of what it was like for you getting ready for church this morning probably awakening, awakening, thinking you were going to be coming to either the 915 or the 11, and then realizing the damage from the storm, there's a groaning. For many of us, we groan every morning, every morning that the alarm goes off, we hit the alarm and we groan that the day has started and we wish that we could just stay in bed a little longer or that we had no responsibilities that day. 
Others of you, you groan on Sunday nights because you love the weekend and you know that Monday morning is coming. Others of us, we groan when we open the mail for those bills that we expect and those bills that we don't expect. Others of you are groaning because of relationships inside the church. And let's be honest, just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean that the relationships that we have with one another are the best that they can be. And so we groan when we walk into the presence of other people many times because of broken communication or some misunderstanding that has not been dealt with. Some of us are groaning in loneliness if there has been something that has hit all of us through this pandemic in the forced isolation that has been placed on us, there are so many people that are struggling with loneliness. Right now as a pastor in the city, we're trying to help people get connected to quality counseling. And we are finding that we are six in seven referrals deep trying to find counselors that can point people to hope in Jesus Christ because there are so many people right now because of the last year and a half are struggling with loneliness and the mental fight that has been waged against us under the last few months of circumstances. Many of, many of us groan because even though we're adults, we are still lacking purpose. Like, what am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? There are so many places. So my question is, is where are you groaning today? Where are any of us groaning? Where are we groaning today? We are, I believe, um, going through all different types of pain. I found out a little over a month ago that my mom at 75 years of age was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I was walking out of a staff meeting and then receiving a phone call from my mom. And so I go from the troubles of the church to the troubles in my family. And there's groaning because of just the fact that cancer is still in this world and it is attacking people and people that we love. And there's a groaning and that groaning isn't just in the physical body. I feel like it's in the soul of who I am as I want to care for his church and care for my mom and care for my own children that are facing. And so we're groaning. And I want us to see here in, in Romans chapter eight, where we're gonna be spending the day is that groaning is a natural reaction. It shows that you and I are human and that we are, we are engaged in this world. The groaning, I do believe though, is pointing to something much deeper. And I believe that the mission of Forge Road and the calling of you guys to be a family of God that is pursuing the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ into our community, that this Romans 8 passage should encourage you as you are looking to leverage everything that God has given you as a resource to the people around you, the people on your way every day, or the people you're strategically trying to reach out to in our great city. And the groanings that we feel are a reminder to us, and I'd love for you to write this down, are a reminder to, of, of, to us of the future that we're longing for in God. Let me say that again. The groanings we feel are a reminder of the future that we are longing for in God. So the, the longing for there not to be pain in our day, the longing for victory over cancer, I believe is us longing for God's total control over every situation to be fully manifested, fully present, where there's no more sickness, no more death, no more dying, no more brokenness, no more war, no more famine. That is a longing in our heart. And I'll talk some more about that. I believe another way that we could say this is that our groanings are our desire for things to be made right. I believe as Paul is trying to encourage this church in Rome and as we find ourselves in Romans chapter eight, he is wanting them in the midst of one of the worst world powers ever, in the midst of the highest taxation in a, in a civilization that we could probably ever imagine, in the in the place where they saw people hanging from crosses on a daily basis. He's trying to help them to see that their groaning, their longing is for the, the way that God wants it to be, to be fully present. 
And that can be a powerful thing, which I believe Paul is getting at here in Romans 8. So Romans 8 has the word groaning repeated multiple times throughout the chapter. And if we were to just take the word groaning in the English dictionary, it means a deep inarticulate sound conveying pain and despair. So we've talked about that a little bit already. And so some of us, when we've been sick, natural response, our body groans. And we, I am a terrible sick person. I might be confident in being a pastor in the city, but when I get sick, I am a child. And my wife, if she was here, could testify to that. My body groans and my response to that generally can be extremely immature. But Paul notes that groaning is taking place all around us. And you and I, we can see that. We can see the groaning um, on the news locally from last night, the storm damage, the apartments that were destroyed in Parkville, families displaced, the pain of that. There's a groaning this morning, not just at Forge Road, but in multiple places around our community of just what that storm did. We can also see the groaning of how children are in fact, have been made sick by drinking water that was lead contaminated in major metropolitan areas. So that's like, man, that, that's, that's, that makes us like, how can that happen in the 21st century? We, some of us are groaning because we're seeing how, um, you know, the rainforests are being destroyed in Brazil for lumber. And so some of you are way involved in like the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the restoration of waterways and cleanliness. And some of you have even desired to be able to swim across Baltimore Harbor at some point. When we moved into the city in 2008, I was like, Lord, by the time our ministry is over, would you please allow us to be able to swim in the harbor without getting a tetanus shot? Like there's a, there's a real desire to see creation restored and watching the news and seeing the fire, the fires out West right now and watching people stand and looking through the rubble of their home from where it was just entirely consumed by these hillsides that have just become a blaze. There's a groaning in the earth for these things to cease and these things to stop. So many places were groaning because of the ways that because of our economic advancement, there's times that nature is damaged through that. And so there's, there's a lot of ways in which the earth is groaning and we're growing through sickness and pandemics. And Paul is saying to them that that groaning isn't necessarily a voice to be ignored. It's something we probably ought to pay attention to. And throughout the groaning, Paul says here in Romans chapter eight, creation is crying out for help. Now, there's a similar place, a, like a parallel thought that's found, I believe, in Exodus chapter 2. Actually, I know it's in Exodus chapter 2. In verses 23 through 25, it's talking about the nation of Israel in slavery. And listen to what it says. The Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. And let me just say this. You will not find four more encouraging words in this text than God heard their groaning. And can I just say to Forge Road this morning from our brothers and sisters in Christ that are meeting there, when you groan, God hears your groaning, whether it's for something in your own soul, something in your family, something at your place of work, something in your community, something in our city, or something around the world, something that makes you groan, God hears our groaning. And the nation of Israel, even after they received their freedom and they groaned in the wilderness. They groaned against their leaders. They groaned against God and they went into the promised land. And as they went into the promised land, they still bumped up against groaning. And in their um, exile, they groaned. And it wasn't until Jesus came and, and God did something miraculous against sin and against the brokenness in the world and delivered us from sin and death. That story of groaning was constant in the Old Testament. And now we're finding that there is still groaning in the new covenant, the new relationship that we have with God, because we know that one day, and you can write this down, one day, God will finish the work and make all things right. But in the meantime, it's like labor pains. Like we know that there's this beautiful new life that's going to come into the world, but it's not fully here yet. And there's pain associated that, with that. 
And Paul wants this early church in Rome. He wants them to know that all of creation is groaning and waiting. So my question is, is why does he want this group of believers in the city and area of Rome that are most likely gathering in homes and are trying to encourage each other in their faith in Jesus Christ? Why would it be so important for him to want them to understand that they are a part of the creation groaning, the earth and humanity groaning together? And I believe he answered that in verse 19 when he said, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation is waiting not for God or Jesus to return. He is waiting for the children of God to be revealed. And let me ask us as a church, obviously this is rhetorical because you're not able to talk back to me, but who are the children of God? Who are the children of God? It's the church. We are the children of God and we are called the church. And so the body of Christ, this church is what the earth is longing for. And so one of the most significant problems I believe in our faith is when you and I ask God to do the things that he's asking us to do. You might want to write that down. Let me let, let me say that one more time. I believe that one of the problems in the church is that in what I believe is one of the most significant problems in the church is that our faith, our sometimes lack of faith, is when we start to ask God to do the things that he has asked us to do. So many of our prayers are resignation prayers and not prayers of asking God to do a great work. Let me give you an example. Lord, there is nothing that we can do against the problems of Baltimore, so you better get here and fix it. Other ways that this resignation prayer hits this in my own personal world, like 15 years ago, I I asked the Lord, Lord, would you please bring together a diverse group of people in Baltimore? But after a year or two of being here, I realized that God wanted me to be actively involved in doing that. And my prayer changed to, Lord, would you please help me through the power of your Holy Spirit to bring together diversity amongst people of different skin tones and different economics? Would you help me to do this? I know this is pleasing to you. My prayer many times was, Lord, would you please just end poverty? And then my prayer changed to, Lord, how can I end poverty with the people that are along the way in my life? I can't settle the problems of poverty globally. But Lord, I know that you've asked the church to be engaged with orphans and widows in their distress. And Jesus set an example of taking care of the poor. And Lord, help me to do what it is that you're asking me to do. Many times, I believe that one of the other ways, and I appreciate the way that Tom led into this prayer with praying for the sick. I think many times we as a church relegate the care for the sick to God. Like, God, there's nothing I can do. I might take them a meal, but Lord, there's nothing I can do. When God is saying, no, I want you to be actively involved with the sick, lay hands on them, anoint them with oil, and even charging the elders of the church to be physically present with the sick. And so, so often, I believe that the problem of the church is resignation in our prayers and not engagement in our prayers. We need to stop asking God to do what he has asked us to do. So let me give you an example of this. How would you feel, for those of you that have children, if you, if your kids responded to you by saying, um, when you say to them, go, I, hey, I want you to go pick up the trash around the house. And they said, no, that's too much work. How about you pick it up? I mean, that's kind of probably wouldn't fly over really well. How how would you respond if an employee at your work said to you, you know, that's just too much to do. How about you do it? That wouldn't go over very well. But let me just say, church, and I'm not meaning this in any way to be offensive. I'm just talking to you as a pastor that for the last 13 and a half years has been lever- has been living in and amongst the people that reside here in Baltimore from east to west, north to south, from everywhere from Federal Hill to Penn Lucy to um, 
the Eastern District Police Station to the Western District Police Station. And I am finding that people, because the problem seems so great, are just resigning and like, God, you just need to do this. It's just too difficult. But I believe God in the creation, you and I are being asked to be his hands and his feet. And, and it's waiting for us to be revealed. It's waiting for you and I to be engaged. I believe that the children of God are what people and creation is waiting for. And let me say, let me answer this. Why? Why would I believe this? And according to Romans 8, I believe because you and I are the very present signal that help is on the way. You can write that down. Help is on the way in and through the church that Jesus died to start. What does it mean when you and I show up to respond in the community and provide help, but the community's response is, oh no, man, the church is here. The reputation of the church arriving on the scene has become so diminished in our culture what does it mean when you and I walk out of our building and see people on the sidewalk or you and I are in our communities or in our neighborhood or if you're heading to an Orioles game and you're walking along the way and people know that you're a Christian, what is the response? Is the re response, praise God, help is on the way or oh no, man, these Christians just showed up. Now, again, there's persecution because of our faith in Christ and our theology and the things we value but our character of loving and showing the service and the love of God to others should never be in question. The response from people when they see us should be, yes, they are here. Help has arrived. In verse 23, um, one of the translations says, we, we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory. And I love the way that the New King James translated that, that we are the first fruits of God in the world. And let me let me talk about that briefly before I get ready to close. But when we groan individually, when the creation is groaning individually, we are groaning for the sons and the daughters of God to be revealed, the church to be revealed. So why would Paul talk about a first fruits? And so in the Old Testament, what was the first fruits? The first fruits in the Old Testament was people gave to God their first of their harvest. It was the we know more is coming and so we're going to give you the first because we know more is coming and you deserve the best. You deserve the first offering. You are worthy of, of, of my trust and my hope, knowing that the harvest will be plentiful. There will be plenty to go around. It was a worship offering that the people were giving to the Lord as a way of expressing their hope. Now, what we see in Romans 8, according to Paul's encouragement to the early church, is that the church, the children, the sons and daughters of God are the first fruit offering to the rest of the world. So now it's switched. It went from us giving our first fruits to God to God saying, I'm going to give my first fruits to the world. And I hope this is an encouragement to you this morning is that God has given himself. He's given Jesus Christ. He gave the Holy Spirit. And now he's giving to the world, the church, as a first fruits offering to say that there is a complete harvest coming. There is a hope that there is more on the way, that the way that things are, are not the way that they're going to be. And here, look, here's the first fruit. Here's the first glimpse of the peace that passes all understanding. Here's the first glimpse of the new creation, the church living the way God intended for it to live. Taste and see that God is good. We see this language of first fruits meaning so much to the early church that they were looked at by God himself as a special gift to the world, to all of creation. My family groans when I sing, let me just help you understand this just for a minute. My family groans when I sing. And if you've ever done karaoke, you know there's people that step up to a karaoke mic and they do a great job. They know the song, they sing it, and you're like, wow, they maybe even sang it better than the artist. That has never been said of me. 
And the problem is, is they don't just groan because I can't carry a tune. They groan because I mess up the lyrics. I could be singing the, a hymn. I could be singing a worship song. And there is just something about the way that I'm wired that lyrics and music and tone deafness and all this, like I am a natural disaster as it relates to music and singing. And the reason why is that my family knows the way the song is supposed to be sung. They know it. And it drives them crazy when I try to sing a song that I can't sing. In church, let me just say this. We know the song. We know the way that God wants to live and breathe and act in this world. We know the music. We know the tempo. We know the way that it should be. And we groan when it's not that way. And I believe that Christians should be the most sensitive and aware people in all the world. You and I, because we know the joy of our Father in heaven, because we know the truth of Jesus Christ, because we know the gift of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus taught the way that it should be. You can read that in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, because we know we groan all the more because we see the way that that death and sickness and brokenness and, and the way that selfishness and poor leadership is destroying the world because we know that there is a better way and that is found in and through Jesus Christ. But the community around us needs to see a church that hasn't resigned. Baltimore City has over 2000 churches, but yet we're still fighting what seems to be a endless battle, a battle that we seem to be defeated in on every front. But let me just say this to us, Forge Road believers, partnering with Gallery Church Pastor this morning, let's not resign. Let's not just say, God, you have to fix this. All of creation is longing for you and I to be the sons and daughters of God. And I believe you're in a church where you can be taught what that looks like. I believe that the elders of your church are trying to faithfully show you what Paul did to the church in Galatia and Ephesus and Colossae and Philippi as a way of discipling them to live their lives following after God. And we need to fully allow the work of the Holy Spirit to be completed in us because our city is groaning. It is looking for you and I to live that life that we were intended to live, not the life of the world where we're like, I'm just glad I'm eternally secure, but I'm going to go ahead and live like everybody else around me, all about myself and my own needs. No, there's something special in the church that's invitational when we patiently endure and we sacrifice for ourselves. We sacrifice ourselves. We give ourselves up so that other people can be loved and cared for and needs met and, and, and introduced into the family of God. So as I close this, let me just say this, God has not forgotten us. He hears our groanings. He hears our prayers. And when our heart groans, he answers us. So groan, keep groaning, knowing God hears, but don't resign. Don't leave it up to others. Join in because our city, our region of this state needs the church to function as one so that the father and giving the son will be trusted and believed in because they see the good deeds that we're doing together. So let's guard our hearts. Let's listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to give you a bunch of things to say, so do you fit this category? I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to speak to you this morning. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you about your engagement? Have you resigned? Have you just thrown up your hands? Are you, are you investing more of your time into your personal development or are you giving yourself up like Christ did for the sake of others? Let me just take a minute now to pray over you and I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom to end our gathering here online together. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much that your Holy Spirit speaks to us. I thank you so much that we even have the words of Paul recorded to the church in Rome so we can look at it. But Father, we don't want to resign. We are saying to you, we want to be the church. We want to be fully empowered by your Holy Spirit. We want to give ourselves like Christ gave himself. So Holy Spirit, speak to us. I know each of us on this 
video call or video service is, is in unique situations. Some are giving faithfully of everything that they have and others are holding back. But Lord, let your spirit bring the conviction. Let your spirit move people. Lord, we want our faith to impact our calendars. We want our faith to impact our pocketbooks. We want our faith to in, impact the talents and the, the giftings that we have. Show us what it looks like to be the sons and daughters of God in this generation that the whole world is groaning for. So Lord, we want the good news of Jesus to keep moving forward, and we want to be a part of it. All the parts are necessary. And so, Father, we are asking, help bring us together to complete the work that started in Jesus Christ that has been given to us. And so, Lord, we are asking for your strength to endure patiently, laboring day in and day out until we see you face to face. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ellis, thank you for that um, inspiring, encouraging, and challenging word that we all say amen to, that um, we would be active in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would not be asking God to do the things that he has told us to do. As we think of the things that we have in front of us, we might remember particularly the Vacation Bible School. And that's gonna start in uh, just a week or so. There are uh, so many children who are coming to that. There are so many who have signed up to volunteer. And we thank you for that. These are great opportunities. Indeed, every Sunday, every day is a great opportunity that we have in the Lord. And I trust that we will use this day and each day forward in him. Let's pray and our meeting will be finished. Our Father, we thank you for the grace of your son each day. And Lord, as we see the things that are before us and the challenges that are before us, we are not discouraged, but we are encouraged. We are encouraged knowing that in Jesus Christ, we have the things that that will feed the hungry, that will heal the sick, that will bind up the brokenhearted, that will reconcile those who are apart, that will renew where there seems to, to be barrenness, and that will even bring life from the dead. So our Father, we pray that as we have been challenged anew this morning, that we would uh, together, one another in this meeting and one another throughout our city, work in your, to your purpose, to the honor of your son, and that the things that manifest him would be seen in us and seen in the things that we do. We give thanks in Christ's holy name, praying for the, all of the opportunities and the efforts that are before us. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to Bill for um, putting together the uh, technology to make this work on, uh, I, I was going to say short notice, but really almost no notice at all. And I trust that you will, you and your family will enjoy the rest of this Sunday, this Lord's Day, in the memory of Jesus Christ. Lord bless you, and our meeting is dismissed. <laughs>